Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel where today my intro is going to be very long and hopefully don't get bored and click off of it. Due to everything happening in the UK media at the moment with the Sarah Everard case I thought I'd talk about something current. I know I'll probably get some backlash for things I might say so I won't go too far but I thought it's important to discuss these things even if I am a little tiny channel. For those of you that aren't from the UK and you're from other countries um, a young woman named Sarah Everard was recently murdered by an off-duty police officer and I believe he approached her and gave her some kind of ID. Um, I might be wrong on that. And it's kind of sparked a whole conversation about how women feel, uh, safety of women and how they feel around men. Firstly, I'd like to say that it's absolutely appalling what happened to Sarah and my heart goes out to her friends, her family and women in general. I think it's really hit home for a lot of women this situation because it's literally like our worst nightmare. I can confidently say that every woman that I know personally has been in a situation where they feel very unsafe because of men or, or a man, a group of men, or have been sexually harassed or assaulted by a man. And I totally understand that it's not all men, but I don't think that this is like the main point here. We know that some men are amazing and incredible, but even the best of men can learn from this and see where they can help, where they can intervene where necessary. When their friends might shout at a girl on a street um, or touch a girl's bum in a club, like it's okay to call your friends out and you know be our allies and not just say it's not all men. I personally think it's a cultural thing and it needs to start with education for the children. My younger brother is 12 years old and he's at that age where boys are starting to like say things about girls, they're starting to like rake them out ten, maybe like slap them on the bum in the corridor, like light-hearted stuff. But you are expected to join in, even if you don't want to or don't agree with it, you are expected to join in. And unfortunately, the first thing that these boys will say if you don't join in is, oh, you gay. And for a young, nearly teenager, that's not what you want to hear. But that's a whole other like issue in itself. You know, even the nicest guys that are amazing and they would never hurt a woman or touch a woman might have been in probably will have been in a situation where like they're in a group and they're, they're sh some of them shout at a girl like oh, hey, or you know whistled and to them it's like it's no big deal but as a woman that you know constantly has that kind of stuff it's intimidating and it can be frightening. Sarah was killed whilst walking home at I think I think it was about 9 30 at night it wasn't like it was one o'clock in the morning I myself personally wouldn't walk home in the dark, but then I think, why shouldn't I be able to? Why shouldn't women be able to walk home at dark? Why are we told, be careful when you go out at night by yourself? If I was a man, would I walk around by myself at night time? Probably. So that's where I'm gonna stop with this because I could go on and on and on. I get carried away, I get frustrated, so that's it. So I was looking into crimes committed by police officers and I was quite alarmed to see that I couldn't find anything specific. I have seen some news articles which um, stated figures of how many police officers have committed crimes that are still in service and how many police officers have committed crimes that have been dismissed. But I couldn't find any, you know, like specific stories of this police officer did this. The only thing that came up in my search was the Sarah Everard case. If anyone is interested, I did actually find a website and I will try to remember to link it down below, but it shows you all of these statistics. So it will show you dismissals within the police service, what they were dismissed for, uh, what rank they were. So like constable, detective and all sorts of figures like that. And I found it interesting. And yeah, like I said, I'll try and link it below. OK, interesting fact, maybe a controversial one, but I'd like to hear your opinions on this, actually. So I was under the impression that if you want to become a police officer, you have to have a completely clear criminal record, but you don't. You can have a conviction and still be in the police force. I read somewhere that it was because they didn't want to discriminate. And also you can remain a police officer if you've committed a crime. So if you're a police officer and you get caught drunk driving, it might not be drunk driving, but something, you can still be a police officer after that. And that website that I mentioned just a second ago, 
that has all of these statistics of like what they've done and they're still in service. I hope I'm making sense here. But yeah, let me know what you think about that little fact in the comments. So one story I did come across was a story about a man called John Bauman. So after that really, really long introduction, let's get some makeup on this face and talk about this case. What am I going to do? So John was born John Earl Bauman, I think it's Bauman, on the 4th of October 1941 to parents Bill and Letha Bauman in Illinois, USA. John's father, Bill, worked on the railways for... railways? Railroads. Railroads? For a living, and his mother was a bookkeeper. The Bowmans had four children, including John, his two older sisters, and unfortunately they lost a child when um, the child was just a baby. I couldn't find a lot out about John's life, to be honest with you, but I do know that he volunteered for two tours of Vietnam when he was in his 20s. And if you know anything about the Vietnam War, you know that it was incredibly difficult for some soldiers um, with their mental health when they returned home. And I think this might be kind of not an excuse, but like a reason why John turned from like a normal person to someone with a lot of struggles. After he did his two tours in Vietnam, John got a respectable job as a police officer in Homewood, Illinois. Ah, oh, it's always in the way. By this time, whoa. By this time, John had become quite a, a heavy set man, shall we say, and he always wore thick rimmed glasses, so this earned him the nickname of Bottles. Bit of a weird nickname, but okay. At some point in this story, um, he does leave the police force because he was dismissed for being suspected of being involved in a robbery at a gas station. But I couldn't find out exactly when it was that he was dismissed from the police force. So somewhere along the line, he was dismissed. While he was still in the police force, however, he met a woman called Gertrude, whose nickname was Trudy. And the pair eventually married on the 17th of July, 1964. They went on to have three daughters together and they lived what seemed like a normal family life, or at least that's what it seemed from the outside. Fast forward a few years to the 26th of July, 1970, when the body of Sergeant Dean F. Spence was found murdered and he was found near Prestwick Country Club in Will County. He had been shot with a 38 calibre revolver but Sergeant Dean was actually a close friend of John's because they were colleagues in the police force. There were no signs of a struggle or a robbery, so the police decided that they would just interview everyone that was close to the sergeant. They quickly ruled out the sergeant's wife, uh, so they decided to interview John. So when the police informed John that his friend had died, he came off really surprised but his wife Trudy was not as surprised. The police actually had suspicions that Trudy and Sergeant Dean were having an affair so this would give John a motive for murder. However once in court there just wasn't enough evidence um, to prove that John did this so he was let go and he walked free. But basically everyone that was involved in the case at the time think that John did it. So we fast forward again 14 years later to April of 1984 when policemen responded to a blaze at a Bellman's house. According to John, and this is like the most ridiculous story ever, but according to John, him and his wife Trudy were in the garage and they were inspecting some equipment. He said that all of a sudden his wife tripped over a stove which ignited some gasoline and set her on fire. And because she was panicked, she started flailing her arms around and somehow this resulted in an injury to her neck. However, the examination by the coroner would say that this story was false, really, and that Trudy had first been strangled and then subsequently burned after that. It was reported that recently Trudy had told John that she wanted a divorce. So, again, bit of a motive. But even more than that, 
it was also reported that there was quite a big life insurance policy out in Trudy's name. I couldn't find any more information regarding the insurance policy, but again, another motive. Now, in spite of this rubbish story and the obvious murder scene, during his 1985 trial, John, who claimed that his wife's death was an accident, he was acquitted by the Cook County judge for murder. And yet again, this man was released. Now, you may be thinking, how the hell did that happen? He obviously killed his wife. Well, in 1988, John's attorney, Fred Aprati, was convicted in federal court for paying bribes to Cook County Sheriff's Police. And basically, the it was the head coroner that had done the autopsy and looked at Trudy's body, but it was a different county coroner that testified in court. And he hadn't even seen Trudy's body. So basically, it was all corrupted and that's why he walked free. Years passed following his first wife's suspicious death and John had definitely left the police force by then and he was working as a salesman for the Honeywell company. One night he attended a singles dance and he met a woman named Valerie Joyce. She was a vibrant and energetic woman who had four adult children and they really took a liking to each other. They hit it off pretty much straight away and in February of 1991 the pair got married. Okay, this may go terribly wrong. So Valerie was aware of Valerie was aware of John's past, but she believed the claims that he was innocent. Her children, however, did not believe that he was innocent. They were always very, like, suspicious of him. Oh my god, it won't blend in. So things were apparently going well in their marriage. There were no problems that people saw from the outside necessarily. And in 1995, they took a holiday to Antigua and Barbuda. They decided to stay at the Royal Antiguan Hotel. But John John made a boo-boo, basically. Um, so after the incident happened, employees would say that John had booked a, a room for two for the first three nights and then a room for one for the last night. Like, did you even try to cover up what you did? But I guess he had gotten away with two other murders, so maybe he just felt like he was invincible, like, I'm never going to get caught. So that could be why. So on the 27th of May 1995, John and his wife Valerie went up to the top of the hotel that they were staying on, staying at, and this was eight stories up, so it was quite high, and they went up there to have a look at the view. But this is where Valerie heartbreakingly plunged to her death. The fall crushed every bone in Valerie's body, killing her instantly, which I guess is better than burning to death or being strangled like his previous wife. Still not good, obviously. The difference is with this wife's death, though, is that this time there were witnesses. According to those witnesses, John didn't make any attempt to save his wife from falling. And just like Trudy before her, Valerie also had a big life insurance policy out in her name. Again, giving John a motive. John was immediately arrested and held in prison without bail. It was clear to everyone that this man had pushed his wife off of the building. His trial began shortly after and, and some of the evidence that was presented was proof to show that how Valerie had fallen off the roof where she went like outwards whereas if you fell you would just go down she went out which proves that she was thrown off and didn't fall off this was like a, a major part in the prosecution the trial was over pretty quickly and John Bowman received a guilty verdict and a death sentence in April of 1996 John appealed his conviction in the year 2000 but this was denied Shortly after this was denied, on the 21st of May in the year 2000, John died in the Antiguan jail by suicide. 
he hung himself on bed sheets wrapped together and tied around his cell bars of his window. So John had gotten away with two murders and finally he was caught for this third one and he just couldn't take it. So yeah, he killed himself, which is really frustrating when this happens because it's like you don't get the justice because they, they take it away from you. So that is everything in today's case. Sorry about the little rant at the beginning, but you know, there's a time and a place for a rant and that was kind of it, well, kind of my place. Thank you for watching, like the video if you enjoyed it, and subscribe to the channel if you want to see more, and I will see you next week.